Welcome to the Greatest Goal Podcast. This is your host, Pedro Limon, a.k.a. PD Podcast. This is episode 14. People, episode 14. And yes, I split up MLS and Liga MX. In both of the podcasts, I'm going to talk a little bit about Europe and whatnot. But just to keep them separate... And so they're a little bit more clear in my thoughts. I can give a better perspective. I chose to separate both of them. Now, let's start off with Chelsea. Uh, the rumor has it that Real Madrid, well, it's Real Madrid and Chelsea. Real Madrid is looking to buy uh, Cortoy from, um, from Chelsea. And that sort of has a domino effect in the other things that teams are going to be looking for. This is what's going to happen. What's rumored that's going to happen. Real Madrid is going to take Cortoy out of Chelsea's hands. Now Chelsea has to look for a Class A goalie. So what do they do? They got a couple options. Uh, one of the options was getting Atletico Madrid's goalie which is not going to happen. Uh, so that's pretty much shut down. But they have to look at other options. Another option is getting the kid from Atletico Bilbao, uh, Kepa, uh, Arispa, Arispa uh, Yega, which has really caught the, the eyes of, of lots of uh, uh, European uh, teams. He's in a smaller Spaniard team, but he's already rumored to be sold to Chelsea for the highest amount any European club has ever paid for. And the rumor has it that he's going to be around $80 million. That is uh, according to Diario Marca, the Spaniard uh, newspaper. So it's sort of going to cause a domino effect and other other things that have to happen. Uh, another one that's not even mentioned in the article I'm reading on ESPN Deportes is what's going to happen to Keylor Navas if this all comes to fruition? Keylor Navas is a hell of a goalie, and like I've already told you on the podcast, it, goalies, there's not... When there's elite goalies or really good goalies, there's not that much of a difference that they're going to make in the game. At the end of the day, they're there to stop goals, not to make goals, not to create assists, not to give a pass in the midfield. They're there to stop something that the defense uh, messed up in or got penetrated through or had an error. At the end of the day, all you need, in my opinion, is a solid goalie. Now, Keylor Navas, like Courtois, like, Courtois, like uh, Kepa, they're all good goalies. You could speculate and discuss and say one's better than the other and whatnot. And that's fair. Everybody has a different taste. And some, A lot of this is subjective. But at the end of the day, like I always say, all you need is a solid goalie. You don't need the best. Like I said, goalies are there to stop something that the defensive line messed up in. They're not, they're, they're not there to score a goal, to give an assist to organize uh, the midfield or the attack or to uh, do something out of this world. They're there to stop literally an error. Or uh, they're a last, literally the last offense to, 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 do, to be able to stop a, a goal. So, honestly, I think this is a stretch from, from uh, Real Madrid wanting to get maybe rid of Keylor Navas. Or, or, or Chelsea wanting to make this 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 move for for Kepa, which I've seen play. I mean, I haven't watched him enough to the point where you say where he catches my eye. But um, it seems like an exaggeration. This whole transaction, this whole rumor. I don't know if it's a lot of fluff because it sounds too too crazy. Honestly, it sounds way too crazy. So. Um, I don't know if this will happen, but it is definitely it is definitely going to cause news 
in England. It's going to be something that's going to be talked about in Spain, in uh, in a lower team like Atletico Bilbao, and in a bigger club like Real Madrid. And um, honestly, it's not going to be fair to Keylor Navas if this happens because Keylor uh, did not go to uh, to play with his national team because he prioritized Real Madrid. And uh, honestly, it would be like Real Madrid shooting themselves in the foot or not really giving a fuck about Keylor Navas. That's just my perspective. And remember, this is from the fans' perspective. It's not going to be sugar-coated. I'm not going to talk softly or not say bad words. I'm going to say how I feel, and I'm going to call it what it is. And you have to call a spade a spade. And if Real Madrid goes through with this, allows this, and sends Keylor packing or to the bench, they're going to be fucking themselves. Now, on a lighter note, let's move on to Usain Bolt. Remember when I told you guys that Usain Bolt was on the prowl for a, for a soccer team? He was uh, looking to play. It's been his... Uh, one of his favorite sports, and he says it's a it's a it's a, a childhood uh, dream that he's had to play soccer professionally. So I told you about Chalice uh, having a, a team in um, in the U.S. in Las Vegas. I'm not sure which league they're in. They're not in the MLS, uh, but he was uh, he said that he would he would welcome uh, Usain Bolt to his team. That it would be nice for him to have him there. And uh, I guess an Australian team by the name of the Central Coast Mariners beat him to the punch because they have signed Usain Bolt. Yes, the gold medalist Usain Bolt is going to play in Australia. And uh, let's see what he does. This should be fun. I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's any highlights right now and probably upload them to the to the to the greatest goal Facebook page to see what he's got if he's been training or, or whatnot. I'm just gonna see if there's anything on him. But that is in the news. Usain Bolt to the to the what the hell are they called? Central Coast Mariners. Oof. Let's see what they could do. They're in Australia and it is a professional team. It's not a second division. This is the actual or is it? The A-League. It's called the A-League. Sorry, guys, but I'm not going to know about the Australian League. I mean, you got to be kidding me. What the hell is the A-League? Is that the actual League League? It doesn't matter. Um, the the CEO of the Central Coast Mariners, uh, Sean uh, Mielkemp, uh, gave uh, Usain Bolt uh, a warm welcome, and he said that Let's see what the world's fastest man could do in a, in a football sport. Now, here's another thing. He does say that this is a good marketing um, approach. Now, I don't know if that's enough to say if that's all this is, is a good marketing approach. Because if Usain Bolt steps on the field and he's completely sad, that's going to be embarrassing not only for Central Coast Mariners, for the Australian team, for the, for the CEO – but also for Usain Bolt, if he can't even uh, do somewhat of a decent job. But let's see what happens. Central Coast Mariners. My goodness. I think if uh, they played uh, like an MLS team, like the lowest level MLS team, I think uh, the MLS team would probably win like 4-0. Anyways, now let's move on to Arsenal's... Uh, Arsenal's rumor mill, they're looking to to approach uh, Dembele. Now, this is weird because Arsenal historically has never been the type of team to go out and purchase a big-name player for a lot of money. And it seems like that's what they're looking to do. They're already saying that it would be around $115 million. I'm not sure if this is going to happen, but... The Arsenal doesn't have a culture of, of of wanting to buy the biggest player for a lot of money. They had it in a moment in time for a pinch when they had to re and re and whatnot. And they had a couple other good players in the defense and, and midfield and whatnot. But 
Uh, I'm not sure that that's the Arsenal culture. They're, they're more willing to buy good prospects, which Dembele, I don't know if you could call him a prospect. And even if he is, that's an expensive ass prospect. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And I don't know if, if, if that's a, such a smart move for a player that's not a guarantee yet. For a player to be a guarantee, he has to have two good seasons of him killing it. You know, where you know that the, that the level of play is there. It can't be two games, three games. It can't even be a season. To make sure a good two seasons killing it, hey, that's a, that's a quality player. But let's see what happens with that. Now, this week it was a bye week in the MLS because the MLS All-Stars played against Juventus, which we're going to recap and we're going to talk about right now. But, like I said, um, a little bit of topics... That's why I threw some European football and some rumors and whatnot in there. Uh, but shoot, let's get right to it. The MLS uh, All-Stars versus Juventus. Now, it was a good game. It started out with the MLS. You know, it's always weird with these games. It seems like the Europeans don't feel like trying unless they're threatened. And if they start to get made look stupid, then they start to try because then they get, they're getting embarrassed. But they go in, into it with the intentions of, oh, this is a friend thing, nothing happens. But then they see the ball getting moved left to right and then not being able to keep up. And now it's like, okay, let, let's let's put on our A game and let's try, guys. So in the first minutes, I saw the MLS uh, playing well. Uh, the MLS also was playing really well. I liked, um, what's this kid's name? Uh, I think he was behind the striker for the MLS All-Stars. Uh, Almiron, uh, that kid, he's uh, fast, he's wiry. Um he, he sometimes looks like he doesn't even know what he's gonna do uh, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't it doesn't make sense but sometimes it it comes out to his uh to his luck you know and sometimes you need a little bit of luck but yeah it's, it looked like he was uh wreaking a little bit of havoc the defenders couldn't really um, uh, get a hold of him but he wasn't doing nothing out of this world neither but he was playing well surprised me I liked him uh Piatti uh, he was really quiet on the on the left side. He was a winger on the left side. Didn't really uh, do much. He was the first guy to get subbed out in the first half. So that tells you something. But th at the same time, uh, there's like seven substitutes that they're allowed in these type of friendlies. So uh, obviously they were going to get um, some players out and some players in, especially when it's an MLS All-Star and they want to give all the guys some play. So I liked uh, Almiron, Piatti, like I said, was quiet. Joseba Martinez, I see why this guy's scoring a lot of goals. He's, he's a good nine. He's a real good nine. And, and you could see the level uh, of play when Vela, Almiron, and Jose Martinez uh, touched the ball. And like I said, Jose Martinez, I mean, you could really see uh, why, he's, uh, why he's scoring all those hat tricks in the MLS. I could tell. It, you know, it's funny. I said I was going to keep up. Uh, I was going gonna to keep track of him. And this is the first time I've got to see him. So I get why he why he's uh, scoring all these hat-tricks in the MLS. Yes, he's a real good nine. Now, in the, in the midfield, they had two decent decent midfielders like Adams and, and Ring. But uh, for the MLS All-Stars, to not have uh, better midfielders is sort of disappointing. Jonathan Dos Santos came in in the second half. And I could see that he was a little bit one step ahead of everybody. But nobody was moving. See, when you receive a pass from, from a player... Let's say, let's say I'm I'm Jonathan Dos Santos, and I get a pass from uh, the defense, and me in one touch give another pass to a to a winger on my on my right side, right? But it's one pass, and as soon as that winger gets the ball and is surprised that he got it so fast, he gives it back to Jonathan. You're not seeing that he's not on the same mental capacity as the midfielder, as Jonathan. Uh, what you want to see is them being uh, linked in at the same tempo. If we're playing one touch, let's try to get out of there in one touch or look for your option. If you know the ball's coming towards you, look for your option. So I saw Jonathan lots of times where he would get the ball, pass the ball, and they would get the ball and pass the ball back. And it's like, Jonathan's giving it to you on one touch. Now you, he gave you that advantage of getting the ball in one touch. He got it to you quick. Now you do something. And put somebody in the same position that he just did to you. It's not like he was slotting the ball to you in a in a in a dangerous dangerous area. That's not what I'm saying. Jonathan was doing, but what he was doing was thinking ahead of time. And I see lots of times players get the ball ahead of time, 
and the advantage of play that he gave you, you stop and you pass back. That's that's all wrong. You need to do the same thing, but up front. You're already the winger. Now look for your 10 or your second 9 and your 9. Those are your other options. Or look to cross to the other winger. But think of ahead of time. Don't wait to get the ball. And even if you're marked 1v1, you can't do much and you pass the ball back. Think ahead. So I like that. I've always liked that Jonathan does that. He's always done that throughout his whole career in Barcelona when he got a little bit of play where he went to Villarreal. He would always do it. And he does it now in Galaxy. He's always a one step ahead. It's not that he's putting you in a dangerous area, but he is giving you the ball with, with a little advantage. Maybe you're, not, you're half marked. You're not marked completely 1v1. But maybe he gives it to you, uh, gives you the ball so you could run into some space. And instead, you jog to it and pass back. No, you got to exploit it. You got to run into that space. You got to kill it down that wing. And you got to cut in or throw in across or whatever. But you got to think at, at the at the level that Jonathan's thinking. If Jonathan's thinking, I'm going to put you in, uh, I'm going to give you a pass to put you in advantage. Not so clearly because the balls weren't clear in clear areas of the field where you're like in front of the goalie. No, they weren't. But they were put in in a certain way that you could take more advantage of it and you just stopped it's one thing i didn't like uh, about the, the the two midfielders is what they didn't do uh ring and and, and adams uh they didn't do and when jonathan came in he did do but then the players around him uh, would it do that so i would see the same thing when guatemo blanco played in chicago fire he would you would see the level of thinking where Quatemo would get the ball, they would, he would receive the ball, and as soon as he would receive it, maybe maybe stop on the ball, uh, stomp on the ball, you know, hold it, and then uh, give a pass, or it was one touch, and the teammate that received the ball after Quatemo passed it to him would stay stuck. It looked like they had a mental fart. Like, what am I supposed to do with it now? The guy, he just got the ball uh, from one touch. Think ahead. Try to think ahead because the ball's gonna come to you quick. You know, so I, I didn't really, I wasn't really a fan of Adams and Ring in the midfield, and the defensive line was a lot to be desired, especially the two laterals from um, the two laterals from the MLS All Stars. They didn't project, they didn't go and attack, and that's one thing you have to do against, especially against an Italian club, because this this Italian club was came out cautious, not really trying until they felt that M, the MLS team was really outplaying him a little bit, was touching the ball fluidly, was making him look a little clumsy. So then they started to try. And you got to keep in mind that Juventus was actually the first one to score after I felt the MLS All-Stars were really not outplaying them because it wasn't an ass-whooping, but they were holding ball possession. They were moving the ball fluidly left to right. And there was a, got a, there was a lot of a good link-up play. Um, not nothing dangerous, but there was a good tempo to the play that the MLS All-Stars were conveying. Now, at the 21st minute, uh, Juventus did score. And then uh, the MLS All-Stars quickly um, replied at the 26th with, again, Jose Martinez. So it was uh, back and forth for the rest of the game, especially when all the subs were made, when Jonathan came in, when the rest of the guys came in, when Quintero came in, when there's that much substitutions. You can't really do much else. The MLS All-Star team really declined in play. Not because there wasn't quality, but because there was too much um, changes, you know. So that's that's one thing that's bad about friendlies that I don't like. But um, they went to penalties, and in penalties it was 3-3, I think, until uh, uh, Philip Wright, uh, one of the strikers, missed hit post. And then Juventus went on to win the penalty shootout. Like I said, I liked a lot of the strikers, and this is the sensation that I get from the MLS All-Stars and the MLS in general, is that there's a bunch of good strikers, Jose Martinez, even that kid Almiron, uh, Piatti, I've heard good things of, even though he wasn't brilliant in this game, he wasn't he wasn't that good, uh, Carlos Vela, uh, Jovinko, um, there's lots of good strikers. I see an overwhelming amount of talent up top. And in the midfield, it's extremely lacking. And I say this because the only midfielder worth his salt internationally there was Jonathan Dos Santos. Adams and Ring and the guys that came in uh, 
in the second half in the midfield, my goodness, a lot of a lot to be desired if you're looking for players and you have to be looking for them. This is the MLS uh this is what the MLS does. If you want to maximize the talent you have up top, you have to have good midfielders with a good foot. They can't be robust. They can't be robotic. They can't be strong. All that's appreciated. But you really have to have more technical midfielders. And for all of having all that talent up top, they waste their time with getting uh, midfielders that are uh, a lot to be desired. Like I said, there was uh, a lot I didn't like in the MLS All-Star team with the midfield and the defensive line. No laterals that don't project. The center backs don't come out um, gracefully. They can't incorporate into the midfield line. And you have to be a, at least be able to do that if you're going to have such an overwhelming offensive attack. You got to understand, the, the, the teams in the world, like a Barcelona that set the standard of an offensive possessional type football, had center backs that knew how to incorporate into the midfield line. And if you want to exploit the, 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 the talent you have up top with your strikers and your wingers, you have to have defenders that know how to glide into the midfield line with class, with elegance, with their head up looking for a pass. Like, uh, like Piqué in, in Europe, like Rafa Marquez in his, in his day, in his prime. Uh, there was lots of players in Europe that know how to do that. And I'm seeing that in the MLS All-Star that it is exaggeratingly lopsided to the attackers. There's lots of talent up there. Quintero, all those guys. Those are all great talents. But there's extreme, extreme lacking of play in the midfield and in the defensive line. And honestly, I would like to see the MLS teams really step up and start to get quality midfielders and defenders that know how to incorporate. Whether you be your laterals or your center backs. And if you want to push it forward, you look for a goalie like who? Like newer from Germany that's known for what? Coming out and starting counter, getting the ball across, throwing the ball on a counter. That's how you make an offensive, really high-tempo high offensive type team. You have to have all those characteristics sort of pushing in the same direction. And in the MLS, I see they want a lot of talent up top. Two, three pica piedras in the middle. Three uh, stiffs in the middle. Fierrazos. What I mean by those words are really robotic players in the midfield. Uh, really robust defenders and a lot of talent up top. But, I mean, that's why I get it in the MLS every time I see a game. I see, like, there's a lot of quality up top, but I see a bunch of midfielders and defenders kicking the ball up. De punta para arriba. That means hitting the ball with the point of your foot and up. You don't want that. If you want to have all that talent up front, you need to accompany, accompany, accompany it with football. And those those football players need to have good technical ability. And in other areas, not just in the attack. Yes, you have Zlatan, you have Quintero, you have Jose Martinez, Jovinko, all these players. But you need some freaking uh, guys with some technical ability in the midfield. Where is uh, Rakitic in the MLS? I know he's in Barcelona. But my example, my point is, I mean, rather, my point is, when are when is the MLS going to start to get those high-class def- uh, players in other areas? What I feel is that the MLS fan is hell-bent on players with big names, but they hated to see a big name in an area where they can't tell what he's good at. And I remember David Beckham saying this when he got to the LA Galaxy. He said, everybody's uh, here to watch me. He's all, but you got to understand what, I'm, what, I, what I am, what type of player I am. I'm not a player like Pelé that's going to score three, four goals a game. He was exaggerating with those three, four, but hey, maybe I never saw Pelé play. But you get what I'm saying. He was a player that was going to give you an assist or score on a free kick. But he was never going to be a goal scorer. And if I felt like 
lots of lots of um, people, MLS fans, were disappointed in, on the, in the type of numbers that he that he had in the MLS or his performance. He performed well, but they were expecting something different. I, I don't know if they were expecting Ronaldinho. You see what I'm saying? I remember seeing this too, and I remember people comparing uh, Cuauhtémoc Blanco to to David Beckham, and they said, "Well, Beckham cost all this money, so did Blanco, and and Blanco came over and he performed uh, much better than than David Beckham. Had more assists, has had more goals, took his team all the way to a final. Uh, so there was a a lot of a lot of fans that were that were not sure what David Beckham was. And that's what I mean now. I'm not sure if the MLS fan recognizes that there's Pica Piedras in the midfield, that there's not uh, strong midfielders in a technical sense in the midfield. Uh, in the defensive line, there's no defenders with class or dynamic ability on laterals that know how to come and go and attack. Um, they're more robotic. They're more robust. So I don't know if the MLS fan catches that because I caught it. And I can tell you right now, that's what they need. They need some some class midfielders and defenders because that's what they don't got. They have those in the strikers. In the wingers and the strikers, they got it. And their, their goalies are good. MLS goalies are good. You're set on that. MLS goalies are good. So the weak spot of the MLS, I would say, is the midfield and the defense. And if I were them, I would stop looking at Europe and stop getting these European, Scottish, Irish uh, midfielders or defenders, whatever the hell they're getting, and start getting South American players in the defensive line and in the midfield. Yes, in the defensive line and the midfield. Preferably, I would go to Chile uh, for midfielders. They're dynamic, know how to move the ball. I would go to Colombia. It, they're they're a little bit stronger and same thing they're dynamic they have that same ability Argentina obviously Brazil I mean come on and then I see this guy ringing Adams you got to be kidding me not that there were bad players there were they, they were like you know when I say that there's decent players that could play on a level well these are players that could just play here they're not gonna shine they're not gonna uh, be under the bar and get made look stupid. But they're just going to be good enough to be there where they're at. They're not going to do nothing spectacular. They're just good enough to stand where they are. And uh, and that's all I have to say about that. My forest, grump, my forest uh, gum for the kids. Anyways, that was, ladies and gentlemen, episode 14 with that long ash rant. Now, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to the Greatest Gold Podcast. Later.